Welcome to this presentation of Population at the Speed of Life, prepared specifically for Monroe County. Since this is mainly a visual presentation, let's start with some eye candy. The East Tennessee region in 1950. Monroe County, with from left to right, Sweetwater, Madisonville, and Vanor highlighted. Fast forward to 2010, 60 years of growth at the speed of life. Hi, I am John Lamb, producer and presenter of Population at the Speed of Life. I am retired after almost 22 years as Blunt County Director of Planning. I am also president of East Tennessee Quality Growth, or ETQG, covering the 16 counties shown on the map. East Tennessee Quality Growth is a 501c3 nonprofit organization with mission to promote regional and local dialogue along with regional cooperation and local action. This presentation is part of outreach by East Tennessee Quality Growth to Monroe County. Understanding population growth and change is important for various undertakings, whether you are in government, a civic group, a nonprofit service organization, or a business. Making analysis vibrant and optimally useful requires more than just presenting data, tables, and graphs. It requires understanding the life dynamics underlying population growth and change, to glean insights from the past, to comprehend the present, and to imagine the future. It can lead to understanding of how we, from all walks of life and in the many roles we play in our community, fit into the dynamics of population growth and change. It also allows consideration of how the values we hold and apply in our lives and in our communities shape the population we and following generations are born into, live and age through, and exit when our time comes. Knowledge is important, but an informed imagination is more important than knowledge alone. My goal is to engage your imagination and inform it as we consider growth and change of our population over more than 170 years. Imagine Monroe County. Population, Growth, and Change The pattern of single-family residential development can provide a geographical context for the population growth trends to follow. Let's return briefly to the eye candy. Cue into the pattern of residential development in Monroe County in 1950. Fast forward again to 2010. Knoxville was the large urban center of a growth pattern extending regionally into surrounding counties. Monroe County was at the periphery of that growth pattern. Growth within the county showed gradation from urban and suburban clusters around Sweetwater, Madisonville, and Venor to smaller places and out to more rural and less dense areas of the county, including scattered development within the Cherokee National Forest bounded by North Carolina to the southeast. Using the most recent available census in 2010, the county population numbered 44,519 people. The most recent census estimate showed a growth of 2,026 people in nine years. In answering the question of how did we get here, we must look at a trend over time. This was the trend of county population over 110 years, from almost 19,000 in the year 1900, more than doubling to greater than 44,000 in the last population count in the year 2010. There were limited local data for analysis of population dynamics prior to about 1950 but a deeper resource of local data from 1950 onward. We thus clip the graph to focus on population growth dynamics over 60 years. We will return to an important pre-1950 trend later. To understand the dynamics of growth, the decade difference or change in total population provides a start. In this initial instance, the county population decreased by 1,197 people in the decade from 1950 to 1960. We can do the same calculations for each successive decade to discover the trend. And we can graph the results as decade population change. Note the variability. This reflected underlying dynamics or changes in the components of growth. The basic components of population growth or change were natural increase and net migration. Natural increase was based on the subcomponents of births and deaths, with positive natural increase resulting from more babies being born than number of people dying, 
and negative natural increase resulting from more people dying than babies being born. For immediate analysis, summary figures for natural increase were used, reserving consideration of the subcomponents to later. Net migration was the difference between number of people moving into and moving out of the county. For analysis, accounted summary figures for net migration were used, since separate data on underlying flows of people moving into and out of the county were not readily available. We first consider natural increase. We return to the graph of population change shown earlier and add the component of natural increase. The trend was relatively smooth with peak in the 1950s followed by generally continuous decrease to 2010. The peak in the 1950s may be attributed to the baby boom with substantially more babies born adding to the population than people subtracting from the population by dying. Looking at the other end of the graph, we find a smaller amount of natural increase, indicating proportionately more deaths and possibly slowing births. The two phenomena of baby boom and aging population were related, as the large cohort born around the 1950s, along with contemporary older precedent cohorts, aged 60 years into older ages with greater likelihood of death. Across the same time span in the nation as a whole, births showed a variation not evident in summary natural increase. From peak in the 1950s, birth rates and births fell to an initial low in the early 1970s. The large baby boom generation aged through peak fertile years in the late 1960s, through the 70s and 80s, and into the early 1990s, resulting in more mothers and more babies even on a lower birth rate. Overlapping and following in the late 1980s, 90s, and 2000s, increased international in migration was concentrated in the fertile years of the subsequent Generation X and Millennials. The number of mothers remained at a higher level on a continued low birth rate, and this kept the number of births up even as the pace of births began to slow and peak by about 2007. Another reduction in birth rate to record lows in the nation began about 2008, ultimately leading to recent decrease in number of births at the national level. Where then will the county trend go in the future? We reserve that discussion until later, so that we can turn our attention to the second main component of population change, net migration. Recall the graph of population change and natural increase. There were obvious gaps to be accounted. If we subtract natural increase from population growth, we can account for the differences as net migration. Added here in red, net migration was highly variable and accounted for much of the variation of population growth. The decrease in population in the 1950s and low population growth in the 1960s may be accounted to negative net migration or net outmigration as more people moved out of the county than moved in, even as the baby boom sustained high natural increase. The large increases in population during the 1990s and 2000s may be accounted to highest historical net in migration, with more people moving into the county than out. Natural increase, and particularly large baby boom births, fueled growth in the 1950s and 60s, even as many people were leaving the county. This changed dramatically to net in migration fueling growth in the subsequent decades as natural increase waned. Another underlying shift across the decades was notable. The outmigration of the 1950s and 60s was due in part to people moving out of rural areas, with agriculture reaching the end of a long term decline as employment generator. In contrast, the large in-migration of the 1990s and 2000s was concentrated in the urban and suburban areas of the county and included retirees coming from outside the county. So, what may the future of net migration look like? We can add that to the question we had before on the future of natural increase. And we can begin to find answers as we consider population estimates published by the U.S. Census Bureau each year extending our analysis from 2010 to most recent estimates for 2019. Armed with this information, we can begin to imagine a near future. The trend of growth continued from 2010 to 2019. 
As before, we can calculate the differences between estimates to show population change for the nine years of the sequence. Notice the general dip and rise of the trend. The pattern was predominantly defined by variation in net migration. A continuation of migration as the dominant driver in population growth identified earlier for 1990 to 2010. Now consider natural increase. In previous slides, analysis was limited to aggregate figures. The Census Bureau provided a nine-year trend of births and deaths to 2019, allowing us to consider the underlying subcomponents of natural increase directly. Consider first the number of babies born into the population each year. The overall trend was relatively flat, with slightly more births in the first half of the sequence and slightly fewer births in the second half. The number of people dying each year showed a more pronounced pattern of substantial increase over the nine-year sequence. Graphing the two together provides a summary basis for calculating natural increase. In all but two of the years, deaths outnumbered births, leading to negative natural increase, restricting population growth. Graphing the summary figures for natural increase shows a defined trend, downward and progressively more negative. This continued the long-term historical trend of decrease from 1950 to 2010. We can graph population change and the two components together to see a comparative trend over nine years. This is so close to a full decade that you can almost imagine what the next 2020 census will show. I invite you to imagine a near future. If we assume that the last year of the sequence can be duplicated reasonably in the next year, we can sum components across the 10-year span and graph the result as an estimated projected full decade from 2010 to 2020. We then can add our graph from previous consideration of decade trends to allow recent and near future analysis. The trend of declining natural increase continues and goes negative. The component of net migration continues recent trend of decrease. This results in a trend of substantially reduced population change, with growth still positive but not as great as the two previous decades from 1990 to 2010. Let us challenge our imagination further and consider what a future beyond 2020 may look like. Natural increase will probably continue deeper into negative territory as the baby boom ages fully and deeper into senior years, resulting in more deaths, possibly along with a trend of lower births. Hard to say where net migration will go. It may increase, or it may decrease, or it may continue at the level of the last decade. Whatever the case, population change may continue to decrease due especially to the pull downward of greater negative natural increase. This probable dynamic is reflected in official projections published in 2019 by the University of Tennessee Center for Business and Economic Research. Thus, the county is projected to continue growing, but at a slower future pace than the recent peak of growth in the two decades from 1990 to 2010. In the following analysis of age characteristics of population, we will use generations as markers. This was the trend in U.S. births along with generations by birth year. The beginning and ending years of generations may not match other published ranges, but suffice for present purposes. Approximate generation age groups were used to fit graphics of population characteristics by age for five-year cohorts in the graphs to follow. Thus, graphic portrayal will be off by a year or two for the actual beginning and ending birth years of most generations. However, year boundaries and spans for Generation Y, also called Millennials, and the following Generation Z were still being debated at the time of producing this presentation. Note that the Millennial Generation in blue is shown as a 21-year span to the year 2000. Some argue that the span for the millennial generation should be closer to 16 years, bringing Generation Z about five years further into the graph. Some would limit the span of Generation Z to about 15 years, making the sequence of Generation X, Millennials, and Provisional Generation Z approximately the same spans. These provisional adjustments were introduced into the analysis to follow at appropriate points for the narrative. 
but for now we focus on the baby boom. Net migration was the dominant component defining recent trends in population growth or change. We can gain further insight into this component by looking at variation across age of the population. We highlight the baby boom for illustration since it was the generation that spanned our base data from 1950 to 2010. We also highlight the senior population for evidence of retirement migration into the county. Our immediate task is to disaggregate the decade summary figures we saw earlier. We focus first on the decade 1950 to 1960, move the graph to the corner of the frame, and disaggregate the summary decade figure into net migration by five-year age groups, from 0 through 4 years old on the left to 75 years old and older on the right. We highlight the approximate age range of baby boomers present at the end of the decade in 1960 as our reference population marker. And we note the net migration pattern, keeping track of whether there was predominant out-migration, shown below the zero axis, here by label down, or positive net in migration shown above the zero axis by label up when that occurred in subsequent decades. As we follow the tracking by decade to 2010, the decade of 1950 to 60 showed substantial out migration labeled down. We now follow the tracking in successive graphs. Down for 1960 to 70. Up overall for 1970 to 1980 and pause for a moment to note an odd pattern of increase for ages 15 to 19, followed by decrease in the following two age groups. This pattern was characteristic of college in and out, as students moved into the county, entering studies around age 18 to 19, and moved out of the county after a few years of studies. The college of interest was Hiawassee College, which closed operation in May of 2019. Note that the pattern also may include out-migration of young people who leave for studies or leave for work or military service outside the county. Continue to the next decade. 1980 to 1990 saw an overall trend down, mainly from out-migration in ages 25 to 29, followed by dramatic jump up for 1990 to 2000, and continuing up strongly from 2000 to 2010 especially for the older baby boomers. Remember the overall decade-to-decade -decade pattern of baby boom net migration for future reference. Down, down, up, down, up, up. As meanwhile, we turn to consideration of the senior population and retirement migration. Some report receiving promotional information from the American Association of Retired Persons, or AARP, beginning as early as their 50th birthday and this seems to ramp up at age 55. 60 to 64 years old is considered by some as early retirement age. However, traditionally, age 65 has been the indicative age for retirement and Social Security benefits, and 65 has become the standard starting age for defining the senior population. For some of the following analysis, the ages from 55 to 64 were presented as extended context for narrative. Traditional retirement age is highlighted on the graph of net migration by age from 1950 to 1960. Note that net in migration was very small for traditional retirement years and was negative for extended years 55 to 64. Fast forward to 2000 to 2010 showing a large jump of net in migration for traditional retirement ages, along with a very large jump for extended ages 55 and older. In the decade from 2000 to 2010, seniors accounted for 27% of total net migration in the county and accounted for 22% of total population growth. At net count, more than one in five new people was an in-migrating person 65 years or older by end of decade. This provided evidence that the county was a retirement destination. Using the extended ages of 55 and older, net migration accounted for 51% of total population growth. At net count, more than one in every two new people migrated into the group that was age 55 and older by the end of the decade. This was important since the additional population aged 55 to 64 in 2010 
some of whom may have been early retirees, aged to become seniors by 2020, adding to the existing senior population that aged in place from 2010 to 2020, and thus reinforcing the trend to an aging population. Part of the surge in senior in-migration was specific marketing for targeted communities such as Rarity Bay and Venor. Also of interest was the concentration of net in-migration for younger people. Children generally did not migrate on their own, but followed the migration of their parents. The concentration of net in-migration in both the younger and older segments of the population was not characteristic of international migration. International migration was concentrated in the ages of 20 to 54, mainly toward the younger end of that range, and usually did not contain major retirement migration across international borders, nor did it contain a high level of parents migrating with children from foreign countries. What may not be evident was that most local growth was from domestic migration, or the movement of people resident within the boundaries of the United States. This was confirmed in population estimates by the U.S. Census Bureau for 2010 to 2019. Domestic migration dominated the overall trend, accounting for 94% of total net migration for the county. Retirement in migration added to the senior population, but the senior population was increasing in any event due to longer-term demographic transformation. The baby boom again can help illustrate the transformation as we look at the distribution of population by age. Recall the population trend from 1950 to 2010. To see the transformation of population by age, we need to disaggregate total population each census year. We begin with 1950, disaggregating population by five-year age groups from zero through four years on the left to 85 years old and older on the right. Note that the distribution of population by age looked like a slightly deformed and flattened pyramid, rotated and laid on its side, with a large young base and a small old apex. Remember this shape for comparisons later. We add the baby boom present in 1950 as our tracking generation, and we track the generation decade by decade across the screen. We note the growth in the age groups as they aged each decade, either down showing decrease in population or up showing increase in population. These directions down and up for the baby boom correlated with the downs and ups of net migration identified earlier. We track the baby boom across the screen to 2010, on the verge of entering senior years 65 years old and older. We leave the line for comparison to highlight growth or decrease. Recall now the pattern of net migration we established earlier for the baby boom. Down, down, up, down, up, up. By decade from 1950 to 2010. Watch the blue columns for age groups in relation to the pink comparison line to see migration play out in population distribution and to see the transformation of the distribution over 60 years. We begin with 1950 with net out-migration resulting in a shift down for baby boom population by 1960, followed by the sequence of down again to 1970, up slightly to 1980, down again to 1990, reversal up strong to 2000, and finally continuing up strong to 2010 as the baby boom reached the verge of entering senior years. Note the overall shape of the distribution, with substantial population in each age group up to senior years. This was very different from the starting pyramid shape in 1950, and was due in part to net migration, especially for the last two decades. The population transitioned to an older distribution even before the baby boom entered senior years. The relatively large bulge of the baby boom at the time raised concern of impact on future senior population and related programs such as Social Security and Medicare. The popular press and some academic sources had a label for the pending phenomenon, but I prefer to use a more local term, triple whammy. The baby boom was a large generation. Though it swung up and down as it aged through the decades, it grew within the county by substantial net in migration, particularly in the 1990s and 2000 to 2010. And something not evident 
it was a generation that was surviving longer and thus reaching senior years in greater numbers. This last leg of the triple whammy may be the most important factor transforming population distribution by age, from the past and into the future. We will return to this important factor later. But first, let us look at the future senior population in the context of generations aging. This was the distribution of U.S. births by year to 2010, with generations overlaid. We cue on the GI or World War II generation born from approximately 1901 to 1924, and flip the generation sequence as overlay onto the 2010 population distribution by age. We again define the senior years age 65 and older, and age the generations across the screen, decade by decade, projected into the future. Note that the projections to follow assume continued in-migration and out-migration in the future. Thus, the blue columns may increase or decrease as they progress across the screen. We begin with the baby boom on the verge of entering senior years in 2010. Using official projections published in 2019 by the University of Tennessee Center for Business and Economic Research, we see the baby boom aged to 2020 with a large portion of the generation entering senior years. This is the projected situation coterminous with the production of this presentation. Looking ahead another 10 years shows the baby boom fully aging into senior years by 2030. By 2040, most of Generation X will age into senior years, followed by entry of the leading edge of millennials, or Generation Y, by 2050. By 2060, most millennials, defined as a 20-year generation, will age into senior years. But this calls to the fore the alternative definition of generations with Generation Z provisionally claiming ages 60 to 64. If we use a 15-year span for Generation Z and age that provisionally defined generation 10 years, we find the majority of Generation Z aging into senior years by 2070. The teens and young adults of Generation Z present today in 2020, including those that may in-migrate into that generation over the decades, will be future additions to the senior population and will maintain overall population transformation as an older distribution 50 years hence. We can now dig deeper to show the trend of senior population growth as percent of total population to highlight the dramatic transformation of the population distribution over 120 years. This is the trend of senior population from 1950 to 2010 and projected to 2070. The graph shows continuous increase, with a noticeable rush as the relatively large baby boom ages into senior years from 2010 to 2030. The total population also continues growing. To gain more comparable summary numbers, we can calculate the percentage of seniors to total population, resulting in a graph illustrating relative growth. The percentage of total population accounted to seniors age 65 and older rose from 1950 to 2010. The population was aging even before entry of the baby boom into senior years. The pace increases as the relatively large baby boom is projected to age into senior years from 2010 to 2030. This is followed by slight drift upward from 2040 to 2070, maintaining at the higher level as large successive Generation X, Millennials, and Generation Z continue to age into senior years. The drift up after aging of the baby boom is due to assumption of continued strong in-migration into senior years and the extended years age 55 to 64. This may not be a realistic assumption if targeted retirement in-migration wanes in the future. Focus on the 29.76% of total population in 2070. As this relates to the projected population distribution in senior years by 2070. Ask yourself if this percent will decrease in the future, given large future generations assumed to have continued migration into senior years. The percent of population accounted in senior years may decrease if the surge of senior in-migration wanes, 
but the distribution and dynamics of the population at that time will have momentum to maintain a high percent of senior population well into the future. This leads to an important conclusion. The present baby boom is just the leading edge of an enduring transformation in the age distribution of our population. And the transformation will span many subsequent generations, continuing a high percent of seniors to total population well past the turn of the next century. It is not, as the popular press labels the transformation, a tsunami. It is a persistent sea rise that will last for a long, long time. It involves generations present in the population today in 2020 and will involve subsequent generations to come for the remainder of the century and beyond. Let us pause for a recap of what we learned and imagined to this point. We established a continuous population trend from 1900 to 2010 and projected to 2070. Most of our initial analysis focused on the years 1950 to 2010 to illustrate underlying growth dynamics of natural increase and net migration. Natural increase showed a trend of decrease, while net migration was more varied and was the stronger determinant of population change. We used our imagination to extend analysis to 2020 and the near future to show that deaths would begin to outnumber births and natural increase would drop to negative, providing a drag on the still prime determinant of population growth, net migration. Projections indicate that the population will still grow, but at a pace less than that seen recently from 1990 to 2010. Along with all of this, we saw a transformation of the population, with seniors aged 65 and older accounting for a progressively greater percentage of the total population moderating after aging of the baby boom, but with momentum through many generations to carry the transformation into the future and beyond the turn of the next century. What was not as apparent in the aging transformation was the powerful factor which had its origins as far back as the turn of the century in 1900. Nationwide, people undertook to improve public health, medicine, nutrition, education, and overall prosperity. These and other improvements combined to extend lives and push deaths to older ages. The underlying trend was summed in the very important demographic component of population growth and change, survival. We got a heads up when we identified surviving longer as a third leg of the impending triple whammy, with the baby boom on the verge of entering senior population in 2010. To facilitate consideration of this important factor, we use a series of U.S. survival functions every 10 years from 1900 to 2000. The graph portrays expected survival of a cohort born in a given year, here 1900, assuming the death rates by age at the time. In reading the graph, the numbers reflect percent of total population expected to survive by year of age. As example, in 1900, you would expect 80% of the babies born would survive to age 5. That means that you would expect 1 in 5, or 20%, of babies born in 1900 to die before age 5. The graph is essentially the inverse of the death rate. As the graphs progress decade by decade in following frames, the movement of the graph line will go up though some may perceive a bulge progressing to the upper right. In any event, the movement tracks a continuous improvement of survival over 100 years. By the year 2000, the expected survival to age 5 reached close to 100%. This reflected a great leap of improvement from expected 1 in 5 deaths in 1900 to less than 1 in 100 deaths by the year 2000. Of note was the proportion of improvement that occurred prior to 1950. Most of the improvement in survival happened from 1900 to 1950, especially for the younger population, and most of that was due to the dramatic increase in survival for the population younger than five years. There also was a cumulative improvement of survival across all ages, such that a baby born in the year 2000 could expect to greet a near 100% year-to-year survival well into its adult life. 
and expect its cohort to survive to age 50 and older in high numbers. Survival is a powerful concept in considering population dynamics, but most people do not think in terms of demographic survival, tending to think more in terms of how long will I live. Period life expectancy at birth is a computed measure of average length of life for a cohort in a given birth year, assuming mortality or death rates by age in that year. Life expectancy showed considerable improvement from 1900 to present. We will turn to that in a moment. But first, life expectancy as a single measure allows us to highlight some important differences that have underlain aggregate data presented up to this point. We focus on more recent trends from about 1970 to 2010. There was substantial difference in life expectancy between white and black segments of our population, showing a narrowing over time but with the white population living on average about four more years than the black population in 2010. In contrast, Hispanic and Asian Americans lived on average about three and six years more than the white population, and thus seven and ten years more than the black population. Another important difference was between male and female. Females had a longer life expectancy than males, this was true for both white and black segments of the population, with white and black females outliving both white and black males. Calculating life expectancy at age 40 for men and women and correlating with income shows that higher income women outlived lower income women and consistently outlived men at all paired income levels. The variations were substantial with a difference of 10.1 years in life expectancy between high and low income women, and a difference of 14.6 years between high and low income men. Income also had differential effect over time, with improvement in overall life expectancy led more by improvement within the upper income population and the lower income population neither showing improvement nor adding to aggregate life expectancy. We now turn again to the aggregate. Over 109 years, from 1900 to 2009, life expectancy at birth improved substantially with addition of more than 30 years of expected life. We got to this point in two distinct jumps. First, a relatively rapid improvement with much variation to about 1950. Second, a pivot to slower improvement with less variation off the trend line. This was consistent with the trends we saw earlier in survival, pre-1950 to post-1950. The trend had momentum to more recent times with some variation. Recent trends showed a downward drift from 2013 to 2018, which reversed by 2019. But just as the flu epidemic in 1918 temporarily affected life expectancy at the time, so may the present epidemic of COVID-19 also cause a temporary variation through increased deaths. However, the longer-term trend will probably continue improvement, with projected addition of 10 years by the turn of the century. Can the future hold more? Some note that ancient text describes the present situation fairly, with range of expected life from 70 to 80 years. However, other ancient text provides a different perspective, with ideal of 100 years or more for expected life. Assuming successful breakthroughs in medicine and aging research in the near future, we may be on the cusp of that ideal. And some speculate that many in the youngest generations present and being born today may routinely live to 100 or even 120 years old. Not only would this maintain the transformation of our aging population, but also may intensify it in the future. To this point, we have focused on the interrelated dynamics or mechanics of population growth. I want to switch gears now and focus on other less obvious factors. Imagine values and purpose as important underlying factors driving population growth, particularly the value of health. Health is important in sustaining survival and lifespan, and is thus important in the life dynamic of population growth. Health is a central value and may be broadly defined. 
The profession of public health often refers to an aspirational definition that dates back more than 70 years. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. The profession of city and county planning also incorporates health as part of its purpose exemplified in the purposes of the general plan defined in Tennessee state legislation dating back almost 100 years, to best promote the health, safety, morals, order, convenience, prosperity, and welfare, often shortened to health, safety, and welfare. Welfare was an old term that developed different meaning over time. The broader term well-being from public health may serve better in present discourse. We noted earlier that life expectancy varied by gender, race, and income. This was related to variations in health and well-being and also showed broad geographical variation. In particular, the South, as context for East Tennessee, ain't too healthy. Tennessee and many other southern states fall below the national average for life expectancy. Tennessee ranks down 45 out of 50 states. The reduced life expectancy of Tennessee population is related to incidents of obesity and inactivity. Obesity and inactivity are linked to higher incidents of serious diseases that can lead to earlier deaths and thus lower life expectancy. The incidence of obesity in Tennessee showed a dramatic shift over the years, being less than 10% of the population in 1985 jumping to greater than 30% by 2010. Some call this an epidemic that is adversely affecting the health of a large portion of the population. The epidemic goes hand-in-hand hand with inactivity of the population, with Tennessee again showing adverse ranking along with other southern states. So, what is the prescription for better health and longer life? Dr. Bob Overholt of the local public television health and medicine show recommends exercising, eating properly, getting a good night's sleep, and including laughter in your life. Exercise in particular is important and can have beneficial effect on health and well-being comparable to a blockbuster drug, and it can be an inexpensive prescription that includes routine activities of daily life in our communities. Health is related in many ways to our built environment, in which we undertake those routine activities of daily life in our communities, and is an important part of quality growth. This is recognized in the profession of city and regional planning, particularly planning for active communities that can harvest the health benefits of exercise. The profession of public health also recognizes the importance of the built environment in sustaining well-being and there is a growing literature on how we can build our communities to enhance health. The Tennessee Department of Health has recently launched a built environment and health program which recognizes that how we build our communities is tied to primary prevention of disease and infirmity. Let us now tie things together and exercise our imagination. Imagine generations connected with each older generation improving well-being and survival, and improved well-being and survival progressively greeting each new generation. We start with the survival curve for 1900 and overlay generations of interest at the time. The unnamed three predecessor generations span ages in which they would have impact on the health and well-being of their contemporary and future population. The named lost generation was too young to have much impact at the time, but would come of age during World War I to take their literary moniker and impact in the next century. Let us now fast forward 50 years to find the predecessor generations aging out of high impact years by 1950, with the lost generation in their prime along with the GI or World War II's greatest generation and the early years of the silent generation that would come of age at the end of World War II and shortly after. Over 50 years, these generations were instrumental in the big jump in survival to 1950, which greeted the baby boom. The accomplishments of at least six previous generations boosted the health, well-being, and survival chances of the large new generation being born around 1950. 
In recognition of improved health and longevity, let us expand the high-impact years to age 85. And again, fast forward another 50 years. By the year 2000, the first three predecessor generations passed off the graph. The lost generation and the leading edge of the GI generation aged through and out of high-impact years. The silent generation, the baby boom, and Generation X aged into their prime high-impact years. These generations built on the improvements from previous generations and improved by another 50-year increment the health and well-being and survival of the population. The new Generation Z, in provisional age span, was greeted by a small incremental improvement from 1950 to 2000, less it would seem than that which greeted the baby boom in 1950. However, the full story was the cumulative effect over 100 years, which improved well-being and survival such that almost all of Generation Z survived to age 5, and faced much improved expected survival well into future old age. Let us again recognize the improvement in health and longevity and expand the high-impact years to age 90. And let's project to get more recent, to 2020, coterminous with the production of this presentation. We can add the provisional adjustments to generations Z and Y, or millennials, and show a new generation that some are calling alpha. In recognition of recent activism that focuses on the awareness of youth for their own well-being and probable improvements in survival and longevity at older ages, we can expand the years of impact to encompass ages 15 to 95 and include much of Generation Z, Millennials or Generation Y, Generation X, the Baby Boom, and the Silent Generation all of whom stand to improve their own well-being and the well-being of generations to come. We can get a sense of the generational relationship by overlaying the first generations present 120 years prior in 1900. In relation to the baby boom, the links between health and well-being and improvement to survival spanned at least seven generations. This may challenge our thinking to consider a much expanded time horizon for contemplating our important work at hand. We are the first generation of more generations. Just as our predecessor generations improved our well-being, so we have the potential to improve the well-being of our seven-generation span. Our goals need not be limited to ourselves, our children, and grandchildren. Our goals may rightly consider even our great-great-great-great-grandchildren. What we do today, what we build today, can outlive us by many generations. On a more personal note, the baby child, more likely the grandchild, and more likely still the great-grandchild you hold today, may live to hold your great-great-great-great-grandchildren your seven-generation future. I invite you to imagine that this is our quest. Health, safety, well-being, survival, quality growth, both of a healthy population and of a healthy built environment to support that population. And our communities will be better for this. For us, and following generations, to live long and prosper, and be well. Imagine that. This presentation is an outreach of East Tennessee Quality Growth to encourage regional and local dialogue along with regional cooperation and local action. Thank you for imagining with me.